All right. <clears throat> the last nine slides have to deal with the magic of the genetic variation provided by meiosis. So let's talk about what contributes to genetic variation and why it's so important. So check out this little lizard. This is a pretty little girl. Uh, I know it's female. Why do I know it's female? Hmm? How do I know? Is it the, maybe the patterns? Coloration, perhaps? Maybe it's more drab. Maybe the males are brighter colored. Could be the shape of maybe its snout? Hmm. Hmm. Nope. They are all female. This is a species of lizard that can clone itself. Which is really useful if you want to reproduce quickly and there's no males around. But it comes with a disadvantage, and that's drastically reduced genetic variation. If these are all clones of the same female that founded this population, and she was vulnerable to a disease, well, guess what? Every single lizard in that population is vulnerable to a disease. They could be wiped out. Whereas <clears throat> a sexually reproducing species has a large amount of genetic variation. And they can seek out other individuals from further away populations. And they can mix their genes together. And you're far more likely to see the development of individuals that have disease resistance, that are more fit for their area. So genetic variation is truly a, a fantastic in the natural world. So, how do we get genetic variation? Well, one of the ways we get genetic variation is independent assortment. Independent assortment is the random arrangement of homologous pairs during metaphase one. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a 50-50 chance of a chromosome from mom versus a chromosome from dad being on a given side of the metaphase plate. Why does that matter? Well, it's everything. Check it out. Here are my, here's an example right here. Uh, on this case, the, uh, the blue and the orange are on this side, and the blue and the orange are on this side. Or you could have a blue and, you know, the blue on this side and the orange here. But down here in this chromosome, they're flipped because there's just a 50% chance you could have the blue on this side and the orange on this side, or a 50% chance you could have the orange on this side and the blue on that side. And the end product of this, well, take a look, is different gene combinations. So they uh, assigned um, the uh, the they assigned this long orange chromosome to code for blue eyes or brown eyes, and this short orange chromosome to code for black hair. And so. When it's this particular chromosomal arrangement, we get gametes that code for brown eyes and black hair, and gametes that code for blue eyes and red hair. Whereas, if you have the other possibility, the 50-50 chance, then we get brown eyes and red hair, and blue eyes and black hair. So, you get double the variation, just from a single chromosome being flipped. So what's important about this is that kind of variation drives evolution because these variations could be one of three possible things. They could be negative, neutral, or beneficial to an organism in its local environment, to a population in its local environment. And so if a particular variation is negative, it will get weeded out. However, there will be plenty of individuals in the population that won't show that negative variation due to just the sex going on. And then if you have a beneficial variation uh, that allows that individual to reproduce more, you'll start to see that beneficial variation 
propagating in the population. So variation is the grist of the evolutionary mill. Uh, so evolutionary change is a frequency, a change in gene frequency, and variation in gametes. Well, that's automatically altering gene frequency. So how much variation can you get in a single gamete? Well, what's the haploid number of humans? Okay, you need a hint. It's been a little while, I guess. So the diploid number in humans is 46. So what's the haploid number? That's right, 23. Now, because we already established that there's a 50-50 chance that a chromosome could be on a given side at the metaphase plate, that means there's two variations you can have for every single one of those 23 chromosomes in there. And so, to calculate the number of different combinations you can get, knowing that every single chromosome has a 50-50 shot, there's two variations, you just take two for the number of variations raised to the number of chromosomes. So there it is. The random combinations of chromosomes in a single gamete is 2 to the 23rd, or 8,388,608 possible genetically distinct gametes. That's a lot. That's epic. But we can go further into the numbers from there, huh? Well, any given sperm has 2 to the 23rd possible variations, 8.4 million. Any given egg has 2 to the 23rd possible variations, 8.4 million. But specific sperm don't fertilize specific eggs. Fertilization is random. So in addition to independent assortment, we have random fertilization. What does that mean? Well, when a random sperm fertilizes a random egg, you get a lot of combinations. Your parents may have told you you're one in a million. Well, guess what? They lied to you really badly. In fact, uh, e even if your parents said you're one in a billion, they were liars. Because the number of possible combinations when you factor in random fertilization, the number of possible combinations that could have led up to you 2 to the 23rd times 2 to the 23rd, 70 trillion. You are 1 in 70 trillion possibilities. So how's that for feeling unique? There are only 6 and a half or 6 point something billion people on this planet at any given moment, which means it's highly unlikely that there's going to be someone out there with your exact combination of genes. So you are unique. So that's pretty neat. One in 70 trillion. But hey, let's go even further into it. I mean, when you think 70 trillion possible combinations, the Milky Way has 200 billion stars. Uh, there's a higher percentage chance that a star is exactly the way it is than you are exactly the way you are. A big difference. So that's pretty epic. So think of the number of possible combinations. There's more combinations that can arise from a single sperm than there are stars in our galaxy. But hey, a lot of us have families with, a, with more than one sibling. So I have a brother and a sister. So uh, we each were one in 70 trillion possible combinations. So what are the chances of my brother, my sister, and me having our exact combination of genes that we came out with? Well, 3.4 times 10 to the 41st. That's a ridiculous number of potential combinations. A ridiculous number of potential combinations. Just how do we compare the number of potential combinations of genes that you three are out of, well, almost double the number of, well, actually more than double, like orders, that, what is that? That's, that's 
17 magnitudes greater possible combinations than there are stars estimated to be in the universe. So what does that mean as far as the chances of you and your siblings having your exact combination of genes? Let's put that in something that's easy. Percentage chances. So here is the percentage chance that based on the possible combinations of sperm and eggs your parents produced, percentage chance that a family of three kids had their exact combination of genes. I don't know how to quantify that. Your chances of winning lotteries two or three times in a row are way better than that. So, yeah. Pretty neat that you and your siblings came out with the exact combination of genes you did. And now you can see just why variation helps so much in the evolution of a species. Because there's a lot of variation in a sexually reproducing species. It's a big advantage when it comes to providing material for evolutionary change. But this is just straight number of combinations of chromosomes. We're forgetting something. And that's that crossing over can occur. And that's going to create even more variation. Just how much variation? Uh, well, crossing over can happen with any tetrad. Any homologous pair can experience crossing over. More than that, our example was just a single tangle of chromatids. But when you think about it, Crossing over can happen on either end of the chromosome, and it can happen on both ends of the chromosome. And furthermore, it can happen in multiple sites on a single end of the chromosome. You can get a lot of exchange of genes between a single homologous pair, and each of those genes represents a different possible variation. Just adding into the multiple variations there are. Just how often does crossing over occur? Well, in one meiotic cycle, on average, you have 55 instances of crossing over in males. 55 instances in 23 pairs. <clears throat> that means on average, there are more than double uh, the amounts of uh, the instances of crossing over than there are chromosomes. But it gets even crazier than that because in females it's 75 instances. That's almost triple. That's, that's, that's almost three crossing over events per homologous chromosome on average. So that's pretty crazy in the amount of variation you can get in just gamete production. That's nuts. Honestly, absolutely crazy because it's going to make each gamete that much more rare. The specific combinations of genes in a single gamete is just compounded by greater and greater order of magnitudes with each crossing over event. So you're going to see lots and lots of variation. Uh, a little note. The specific numbers I provided for, you know, the possible combinations of sperm and egg, uh, you know, where I was talking about 8.4 million, 70 trillion, you know, 3 times 10 to the 24th, and, you know, what was it, times 10 to the 41st, those numbers, I'm not going to test you over, really. However, this average instances of crossing over, fair game. So... All these numbers here, not so much. You don't really have to memorize them. Uh, maybe the number 2 to the 23rd, but that's easy because you know the haploid number of a human is 23, and there's a 50-50 shot a chromosome could be on either side of the metaphase plate. Two possibilities, so 2 to the 23rd. So, bam, easy. But 8.4 million, 70 trillion, 3.4 times 10 to the 41st, you know, that ridiculously low percentage, don't worry about it. But 
55 times in males, 75 times in females. I can ask questions over that. That's fair game. So, evolution and variation. Change is the one constant in the universe. An organism's environment in which they live is never constant for very long. When you think about an environment, storms can roll through, diseases can pass through, you can have droughts, and you can have extremely cold, long winters. The, ch the, the, the changes in an environment in a single year can be numerous. And so the variation you get from sexual reproduction is vital to a species being able to survive for a long amount of time. I mean, think about it. On a geologic scale, the Earth's environment, the environment of all the different places on Earth, is constantly fluctuating. <clears throat> Continents are moving. The Earth's polarity reverses. Asteroids hit. I mean, you have massive changes. And life survived. And life survived due to, in no small amount, variation. So in an unstable environment, variation is key. Like I said, some individuals with specific combination of genes may better adapt to change than others. So uh, now it's time to talk about what can go wrong during meiosis. So errors can occur during meiosis. What kind of errors? Well, in general, there are two errors that can occur during meiosis. One can occur during anaphase one, and that's a failure of homologous chromosomes to separate. The other can occur during anaphase two, and that's a failure of the centromere to separate. So in anaphase 1, the tetrad can fail to separate, and in anaphase 2, the centromere can fail to split. What does that mean? Well, when that happens, you produce chromosomal disorders. Let's take a look at these chromosomal disorders. A chromosomal disorder caused by an abnormal number of chromosomes in an organism is called aneuploidy. And there are two different types of aneuploidy. There's monosomy, which we call 2n minus 1. That's where you're missing a chromosome for a pair. So if, uh, you know, you're a female organism and you only have one X chromosome, then instead of 46 chromosomes, you have 45. That's a monosomy. And that's why it's 2n minus 1. Only one functioning chromosome for a given chromosome number. Turner syndrome is a mono X female. Then there's trisomy, 2n plus 1. In trisomy, you have a spare chromosome for a given chromosome number, an extra copy. And this can cause some pretty nasty disorders as well. Trisomy 21 is Down syndrome. And XXY is Klinefelter syndrome. So all of these produce disorders, diseases. So uh, there's really no aneuploidy that is good that I'm aware of. If you find one, you better let me know so I can incorporate that because that would be neat. But as far as I know, there's no aneuploidy that produces anything other than a disorder. So uh, how, when does that occur? Well, the key word here is non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is the term for a failure to split or separate. And this occurs during meiosis. In meiosis 1, the homologous chromosomes don't separate. In meiosis 2, the sister chromatids don't separate. The centromere fails to split. And the result is gametes with one more or one less chromosomes than usual, n plus 1 or n minus 1. And so, if I have a gamete that has two t chromosomes for 21, uh, if I have an egg that has two chromosomes at 21 and then a sperm cruises in and fertilizes that egg, 
Well, the sperm carries its own chromosome 21, and now I've got three chromosomes at 21. It's Down syndrome. So non-disjunction in meiosis 1 produces 2 in plus 1 and 2 in minus 1 cells. Whereas non-disjunction in meiosis 2 produces two normal haploid cells, 1 in plus 1 and 1 in minus 1 gamete. So let's take a look. Here is non-disjunction in meiosis 1. So this is anaphase. And here is a tetrad that successfully split apart. And here's one that didn't. And so when we go into meiosis 2, you can see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 chromosomes. Well, in this egg, we're missing the chromosome here because it didn't make it. So we've only got those two there. And in this egg, well, we have one, two, three, four sister uh, chromatids there. So we have this chromosome here and then one, two, three, four sister chromatids there. And so we produce two in plus one and two in minus one. In minus one are destined to produce a monosomy n plus 1 are destined to produce a trisomy. So in this case on the right, meiosis 1 occurs without any problems. But when we get to meiosis 2 and anaphase 2 is pictured here, in this chromosome, centromeres split. So bam, very easy. But down here in this chromosome on this cell, the centromere fails to split. And so we pull two sister chromatids to one pull. Uh, but on this side, non-disjunction didn't occur, so we've got a normal cell. So this cell, being normal, produces two haploid gametes, in. But this cell uh, will have two sister chromatids here, which will uh, essentially unravel into two separate chromosomes. And over here, on this pole, we're going to be missing one. So this gamete is in minus one, and this gamete is in plus one. And so... When you combine a normal in haploid gamete with a, you know, gamete that has in plus one or in minus one, you're going to get a trisomy or a monosomy. So uh, it's pretty bad.